Well, hello everybody. It is so good to be back home. I gotta say that. I gotta say that. Six and a half years now in Fredericton, uh, but every time I come home, it feels so good. And it's particularly good to be back home at Andrew Sutton's, Andy's campaign launch to run as our candidate, your candidate, under the Green Party banner for um, MLA in St. Croix. There's going to be, there's a lot of election talk, there's a lot of election preparedness work going on, but whatever happens around the budget or with Mr. Higgs, uh, Andrew is going to be running one way or the other, <laughs> whether it's a by-election or a general election. So there's one thing we know for sure in St. Croix, there's going to be an election. So we know that. I've just come off a 14-stop tour from around the province. And uh, it was great. We are going to paint the legislature green in the next general election. And if it's a by-election, it's going to start right here in Western Charlotte County, which is going to be so exciting because Andrew is the right candidate for the right time in the right place. As you know, uh, and I know, this riding, your riding, has been without an MLA for quite a long time now. And uh, I've done a little to try and, you know, keep track of what's happening in the schools and do a few congr congratulatory messages in the legislature when important things happen in the high schools here and, and, uh, and uh, bring forward some, a few of the issues along the way where I could fill in uh, for sure and including raising the uh, need for the ferry, uh, year-round ferry for Campobello and, uh, and some other things. Made some visits, of course, down to meet with student groups here in St. Andrews just to get a sense of what was going on. So I've been around on and off to be able to do that in the legislature a little bit. Uh, but uh, that's not the same as having a, your, your own MLA for sure, and you need one, and you need one soon. So um, I want to say a little bit about, a little about, about why we're different and how we think differently. I mean, two things I want to say about that. One, green MLAs, they actually are reachable. They actually will have a conversation with you. This all seems like common sense. Um, but in most, many places, that's not the experience of people. Uh, so we take the, our role as representatives, as MLAs, very seriously. And so the proof is in the pudding. All three green MLAs around the province uh, do this. They have regular community meetings all over their ridings to hear what's on people's minds. Um, we do a lot to try and keep people informed of what we're doing day in and day out, both in the community and uh, at the legislature on behalf of our ridings. And that's exactly the kind of MLA that Andrew will be, no question, because uh, that actually is a requirement. If you're going to be a green MLA, that's how you have to work. You have to work hard, and I know he knows how to work hard, he knows how to work, uh, and you have to do that in a way that's going to really truly represent uh, your your constituents and all your constituents, not just the people who voted for you. I tell people this all the time because they're a little hesitant when I first got elected back in 2014. I said, I don't care how you voted. I don't care if you can't vote, like if you're 16 or 15, or if you're not a Canadian citizen, uh, a citizen yet. My job as an MLA, Andrew's job as an MLA will be to represent everyone in the community, everyone in the community, and to the best of his ability to understand uh, the priorities and preoccupations uh, of the community, the communities within the riding, uh, and do his best to represent that to Fredericton. Because one of the things that's clear is the way things work in Fredericton, they don't seem to understand that people outside of the capital city are smart, <laughs> are wise, know what they need. And uh, <laughs> I'm not talking about my people. <laughs> I'm not talking about the, the, the regular people on the ground, but the folks who work in government um, get into that kind of Fredericton bubble. And that, that starts to happen all the time. I mean, the mayor can tell you that, uh, I'm sure, in his relations with, uh, with Fredericton at the government level. And uh, every time I travel the province, I just, uh, I'm reminded how you know, um, disconnected Fredericton is when you see the tremendous things that are happening in every corner of this province, um, whether it's uh, 
English or French or uh, Mi'kmaq or the Maliseet, Wastaqua or Passamaquoddy, amazing things going on. Um, also amazing levels of frustration about things that people locally are trying to make happen and keep running into brick walls in Fredericton. And one of our jobs is to tear those brick walls down for you. So as an MLA, not only will Andrew be uh, there to represent you, but to help us tear the, those walls down. Um, that's why I said at the launch of the last general election that uh, my priority would be to restructure, and our priority would be to restructure the way government operates uh, in Fredericton. It's absolutely necessary. The centralization is out of control, and we saw that in the decisions to uh, the plans to dismantle essentially six of our hospitals around the province and in, in significant towns and surrounded by many, many rural communities. Sussex serves 30,000 people, Sussex Hospital, for example. Um, that is a result of incredible centralization where the bean counters run the show. And it shows no compassion, no understanding what's going on. A doctor, I was in Sackville last night at, uh, at Megan Mitten's nomination meeting, and uh, one of the doctors from the hospital was there and he says, what people don't understand is that there is a zone when you're too far away from a hospital where if you have a cardiac arrest, like you're in arrest, you're not going to make it. You're just too far, if it's serious. And uh, removing those hospitals as regular hospitals without uh, proper emergency services, those communities will be too far for people with cardiac arrest to make it in many, many cases. That's why some doctors were saying people would die. They weren't being exaggerating. They weren't trying to, you know, just make their case. They were speaking from their hearts, based on their experience. And that's, that's something that we do all the time as Greens. And that's why a Green government will be so different, because our approach is to put the well-being of we citizens and the communities we're part of at the center of every decision, at the center of everything government does. That's the way it should be. We've seen that in the distant past, and it worked, and we haven't seen it for a long time. Instead, what we've seen is other priorities being at the core of everything government does, whether it's growing the GDP to the exclusion of just about anything else as the lens through which they look, uh, or cutting the debt uh, through the lens at which they look, so that when you look at anything else, it, it is um, sort of outliers. And that's why we've been seeing our health system unraveling. That's why we see social development in such hard shape. Um, that combined with the centralization of decision making has got us to a place where there's a lot of work to do, a lot of challenges to do. But part of the solution is, is bringing compassion to the work. And, and you can bring compassion to the work if you put the well-being of people and the communities to which we belong to at the center of everything government does. Because when you do that, you can imagine, it's like water flowing downhill to address issues that matter to people, that matter to our communities. Because if that's the lens you're using, if that's at the core of your being as a government, then it's like water flowing downhill when it comes to doing the right thing. And so that's what we want to see uh, in, in restructuring government and the way government is going to work. And then, move more decision-making and authority to our communities. So we have community-based decision-making, truly community-based decision-making and authority. Um, when I was up north, people were saying, what are we going to do with our economy? And I said, well, one of the things is you've got all this amazing forest land around you that you have no access to whatsoever because it's all tied up um, by uh, the licenses for a few very large companies. You need to have access to that. That's an asset for your communities that you you, it's locked up. You can't get at it. How are you going to generate uh, community wealth and work um, and have a say in how, what's happening on, the, in the, on that forest land with respect to the rivers and streams and wildlife if you don't have some ability to access that and exercise some stewardship over it? That's community-based management, and we need that. You can think of that in every, uh, every area of, of our, our lives. You think about health care. We need to bring back uh, a community role in healthcare. When we had hospital boards, the community was engaged. The hospital boards were eliminated in the favor of eight regional health authorities. Became more distant, but it wasn't that far away. Now we've only got two. And so we would 
we would return, return to a, a, a situation with more decentralized decisions in health, um, with, with a greater number of health uh, authorities in a way, and, reg and, and regional uh, community health councils with citizens on it. So wherever you look, if you think about what's within the um, realm of community um, uh, responsibility where we could make a real difference and should have a real say, we need to bear down and put in place the structures that enable things to be commu more community driven. And so that's um, a really important dimension that also distinguishes us from all of the other parties. Um, so final thing I'll say is one of the other thing that distinguishes us from all of the other parties is our candidates matter because we're a new party. And so it's not a question that people have been, you know, green for generations and so automatically vote green. The vote for green candidates is significantly based on the qualities uh, that candidate brings to bear, on the character of that candidate, on the experience of that candidate, on the ability to trust that candidate, and of course trust the leader who, uh, and the party, I guess, invested in the leader in terms of on the provincial level what we're talking about. So that means we have to work hard to convince people that uh, they can trust us with their votes. And that's a really important thing and I only learned this after being elected in 2014 that so many people afterwards came up to me and said it was a huge decision for me to vote for you. Not because you're not a good guy but I've always voted this way. And I, I wasn't sure whether I could trust you with my vote. I was, it took a long time of soul searching to decide to move my vote to you. It really matters for so many people and probably you, you, you guys feel this yourselves. To move that vote somewhere else like to Andrew running under the Green Party banner with me as leader to trust him, to trust me that we will take good care of that vote. And I know Andrew will and I certainly will. So let's get behind Andrew and win this riding. <laughs> I want to thank you all for being here. It means so much to me. David, thanks for coming down from Fredericton and for being a leader that people can get behind. And Donna Linton, thank you for asking me to do this. <laughs> and thank you for the work that you do in this community. It's so much more important than people know. Colorful language, and all of my friends who have helped do this, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> it means so, so much. I think, uh, I think these days that it's sometimes easy to fall into the trap of feeling like individual action doesn't matter. Like fighting climate change or systemic problems like inequality and poverty are too much for one person to take on. Sometimes we feel as if the problems we face are too much for anyone to bear. But the trap is believing that we are islands cut off from the whole, lacking community and a cohesive vision. So for those today who sometimes feel that way, I want to tell you that you're not alone in this. My generation and the generations that are coming up behind me have consistently said that justice, equality, and climate change are the most important issues to them. <laughs> Thank you, Zoe. <laughs> so to let you know what this is going to look like, I'm going to give you a brief introduction of myself, for those of you who don't know me. And then I'm going to talk about two things. The first is anthropogenic, which means originating from humans, climate change, and the second is economics. When I say economics, I don't mean charts and graphs and numbers. I mean the activity that we all partake in every day. The exchange of goods and ideas and the systems that we use to regulate those. 
As a society, we face these two distinct but related problems. They are both global problems, but the global is also necessarily local. And what we can do is focus on the local. Many of you here know me. Some of you have known me most of my life, and you might be as surprised as I am to see me up here. <laughs> some of you uh, only know me from my work at The Courier, and some I'm just meeting for the first time today. By way of a bio, I grew up poor but happy on the Kingston Peninsula, a beautiful rural area, 30 minute drive north and one ferry ride from St. John. As a child, you're not always aware of poverty. It didn't seem strange to me that there were holes in the floor of our trailer and that the tree-shaped dent in the roof from the ice storm of 1998 was only a reminder of how cool I thought my dad was when he was up there cutting that pine tree into chunks and kicking them off the side of the house. When you're poor and you have strong parents and a good community around you, it doesn't seem strange that sometimes you get home and there are bags of groceries sitting on your front step. I have no complaints about growing up poor. I had a good childhood, and I still find the sound of rain on a tin roof immensely calming. The poverty that I grew up with was a kind sheltered from economic insecurity. We always had food and the necessities of life. It was my parents who bore the brunt of the stress that comes from economic insecurity. This is something that I didn't understand until my mid-twenties, when I had some brief brushes with homelessness, and I came to understand the importance of a social safety net and a strong community ties. When I was 13, I met a friend from St. Stephen at summer camp. And from that point on, I would spend weeks during summers and weekends during school here. I made my closest friends here came to love this place more than my first home. Eventually, I moved here and started university. And 12 years later, I finished university here. <laughs> <laughs> In the space between that starting and finishing, I moved out west. Like many of my generation, I was in search of purpose and money. Happily, I found enough of both. I became a land surveyor, and I worked in the oil sands. I progressed through the ranks and became a project manager. And in that capacity, I helped build some of the largest infra infrastructure projects in the world. I helped build mines, roads made of ice, refineries, and hydroelectric dams. For almost a decade, I was on the front lines of climate change, except I was on the wrong side. Three years ago, I decided that I needed to stop working on that side. And a year after that, I moved back home to St. Stephen. Since then, I've worked at The Courier, trying to tell as many stories as I can about the humanity behind statistics, about the people here who struggle with high heating bills and the seemingly inescapable specter of poverty. I am who I am because of a strong community. But for that, I would have frozen to death on the side of a road in Ottawa in 2007. So today, I'm here to lend my voice to those who feel as if they have no community. Though it is a gross injustice, poverty can be endured with the right support. But we'll return to economic injustice later. For now, let's talk about something a little bit more light. <laughs> Climate change, <laughs> which is the defining crisis of our age. It's hard to underestimate the danger that we are in as a species and as a community. For myself, I like to look up at the sky for some perspective. I've always loved the night sky, and due to its lack of light pollution, it's one of New Brunswick's best features. I found many lessons in its cold otherness. One of those is the lesson of Venus, the second planet from the sun and our neighbor. Venus is the third brightest object in the sky after the sun and the moon. When I worked up north during the winter, I would often set up one of the instruments we used, which was essentially a telescope, so that clients could look at Venus. It wasn't much of a telescope, but it didn't need to be, because Venus is visible with the naked eye. What makes it so visible is its cloud cover, 
which reflects the light coming from the sun. Venus has such thick clouds because of climate change. At some point in its past, Venus was covered entirely in an ocean of liquid water with surface temperatures much like Earth's. Today, Venus is a hellscape, unfit for life. Its atmosphere is 97% CO2, and temperatures on the surface are a balmy 500 degrees Celsius, hot enough to melt lead or overcook a delicious roast. <laughs> Over time, a runaway greenhouse effect occurred on Venus, and its oceans boiled off and escaped into space, leaving only carbon dioxide. Here on Earth, we're still balmy. Through some magnificent accident, our planet is the perfect temperature for us. But for the past 60 years, scientists have been warning us that we have been putting too much carbon into the atmosphere, which is warming our planet. The unchecked effects of this are catastrophic to human life, and we can see it even now. The St. John River floods to historic highs, and this winter and the ones before it are much warmer than the winters of my childhood. In the coming decades, not only will we face the reality of rising seas and changing climate, we will face social upheaval as climate refugees flee low-lying areas and countries whose breadbaskets have gone empty. Without action, we face potential collapse. This is the world that we have made. And in the age of climate change adaptation, where we know what is coming, still we base our economy on oil. Canada is a petrostate, and it has been for most of its history. Decoupling our economy from oil is the most important thing we could achieve. Climate change is not a problem that will be solved with reducing, reusing, and recycling. It is not a problem that will be solved by taking your bike to work or banning plastic bags. These are all facets of a solution, but the most crucial part is the one that is never talked about. The largest polluters in the world are the largest companies in the world. The largest polluters in New Brunswick are the largest companies in New Brunswick. We've built an economy around the cheap energy that is oil, and the benefactors of that immense wealth creation do not want to give it up. They would rather trade the future for profit today. This isn't just their fault. It's also our fault. We have had a part in sanctioning a system which puts profit before people and environment. David has talked about the Prime Minister of New Zealand and her decision to focus on well-being and happiness rather than GDP as a measure of growth and success. New Zealand is not the first country to recognize that well-being and GDP are not the same thing. The Nordic countries of Finland, Denmark, Norway, Iceland, and the Netherlands have all decided that GDP should not be the only measure of success. Here, and throughout the world, there is a growing understanding that we have been lied to. Hoodwinked, so to speak. I like that word. <laughs> Lie, too, about why our economy works, how it works, and what it works for. Of what use is GDP growth when people struggle to pay their bills? What use is the unemployment rate if people aren't making a living wage? And what good is growth if well-being is not considered to be the most important measure of success? It's impossible to talk about well-being without talking about health care. So let's briefly do that. Almost 40 years ago, Canadians embraced the example of universal health care set by Tommy Douglas. And it has become one of our most cherished examples of how here in Canada we care about the least of us. But since then, we have been sold the myth that personal success and financial security is a matter of individual agency and not privilege. This is a lie, a lie told by those who have power and wealth in order to ensure that their share of the pie grows ever larger, while the rest of us suffer austerity. If austerity must take hold, let those who have taken the most pay the most. If we could afford universal health care in 1984, we can afford it now, and, in, and that includes dental, vision, and pharmacare. Here in New Brunswick, we have been sold the myth that industry subsidies are an investment, while health care, education, 
and social services are an expense. This is a lie. For the last 100 years in New Brunswick, we have been ruled by the status quo. And what have we gained? We are the poorest province. And only now are we coming to understand that the wool has been pulled over our eyes. The Irvings and wealthy families like them have taken of the resources and labor of this province and have squirreled that wealth away in offshore tax havens with the cooperation of successive provincial governments, be they liberal or conservative. When it comes to cooperation with corporations, there is no difference between liberal and conservative. You don't become the poorest of anything without being exploited. I'm sick of being exploited. I'm sick of being told that we can't afford to support rural economies. New Brunswick is rural. I'm sick of being told that subsidies to large corporations are necessary. And I am angry that for decades our governments have failed us. They have cut health care with one hand while giving taxpayer money to the Irvings with the other. Does that make sense? Does it make sense to take from those who have the least to give? <laughs> Does it make sense to take from those who have the least to give while giving to those who have the most? I don't think so. But again, we are not without fault. By our complacency, we have some part in allowing this to happen. But a choice made is a choice that can be unmade. We need to work to take back that which has been stolen from us. Because if we don't work to make our voices heard, then we have no right to claim that we aren't being heard. And if we don't work to make our world more just, more adoring of the environment, and more equitable, then our despair about an unjust world is despair at our own inaction. So, now comes the time when I wrap up <laughs> and ask for your help. Not just with this election, but also with maintaining a movement, one that David has started, which demands a better way of living together. I've long said that the, be the best measure of success that we have is how we treat those of us who have the least. With this measure of success, we are not the poorest province but still we can do better. I've learned something very valuable here in New Brunswick in the last few years. Here, if you care to, you can change things. We are blessed with an opportunity to set an example for the rest of Canada on how to move towards a better future. So if you'd like to join me, sign up on one of the tables, and I look forward to hearing your thoughts and concerns after the break.